I've, I've been wanting to do a panel like this for a little while on, um, on managed services. They uh, want you to take your name badges. The, the AV crew sends little messages to us. Um, so what, what we're going to focus on in this session is really selling managed services and how it's changed, uh, how it's, the marketplace has changed, uh, pricing, vendors. There's been a lot of change. We said over the last 10 years, but it's actually probably been a little bit longer than that. So I started selling, well, when I, when I started in... Um, so I started my business in 2001, and 2002 is when I really started ramping up the toolkit. And uh, shortly thereafter, I was on the ASCII tour and had uh, Jim Alves from Kaseya. You guys remember Jim Alves, Kaseya? And he was out there selling, uh, you know, Kaseya as a tool. And we got to know each other because we we're always at these events and you know, we got to talking and he said, we're, we're a software company, we're not a marketing company, but our biggest problem is getting these IT guys to learn how to sell this. And we know it can be sold because we have people selling it, but, there's a, but the industry really hasn't caught up. So that's, that's actually how the managed services blueprint came about because I, I, I went, Kaseya gave me their top 10 MSPs at the time and I interviewed the CEOs and the sales team and said, how are you structuring this? How are you pricing it? Why are people buying this? Um, you know, how are you prospecting? And that's how the original managed services blueprint uh, came about. And I'm actually about to do a refresh of that product. Um, so a lot has changed. And I will point out that up on the, uh, the dashboard, we did a survey and we will do a second reiteration of that because we had to at one point in time take the results that we had and I think it was over, I think it was 156 or 157 when we posted that up, had taken the survey on managed services and we'll do it again and I'm actually gonna roll it out to my entire list just to compare the difference between ma um, producers club members and, and the rest of the industry. But you'll see some of the questions we asked are what are you basically, how are you pricing things, how are you including them? And, and here's what I noticed on the survey survey, um, you know, back, back when I did the, an original survey 10 years ago, only 14% of the people I polled back then, which was, uh, was, was hundreds, only 14% had 70% or the more of their clients on managed services. So in other words, like still the, the industry was largely block hours, break, fix, project work. Um, and the sweet spot hasn't changed. So the sweet spot still is the 10 to 50 PC range. That still tends to be the most. Um, the, the price per seat has gone up a bit. So 10 years ago, the average was somewhere around $110 per seat. And the, our poll indicated that uh, from, from all of you that the average per seat price was about $141. So it's gone up a bit. Um, obviously, far more cloud-based services, cybersecurity taking a, a much larger role, uh, mobile devices now, you know, has morphed a little bit more and now not, you know, per user to per, per device. And uh, in other words, more, it's more gone more per, per user because users have multiple devices versus just, you know, per workstation. So some things have changed and some have stayed the same. And what I want to do with this panel up here is just kind of have a discussion as an industry group and find out how it's changed. So what I want to do, and Willie, I'll start with you, if we can make sure he has a mic, and um, start out, we'll just start out, introduce yourself, who you are, and talk a little bit about your company, like from a managed services perspective, so we can kick it off. So my company is based in a very rural area. We're about two hours north of Nashville. If you think of a map, we're about 30 minutes from the southernmost tip of Illinois. Uh, the city where we're at actually has a population of about 2,800 people. There's about 150,000 people in about a 60-mile radius, so very small area. Um, I've owned an IT company since I've pretty much been 20, 21. Uh, we have been focused on managed services since probably 2007, 2008, and probably since about 2011, I would say that 60 to 70% of our overall revenue is um, based around monthly recurring managed services of some form or factor. Okay. What's your monthly, what's your... Yeah. So, 2016 total gross income was about 1.25 million. 
Um, monthly recurring revenue right now is about 54000 a month um, just in services, not counting you know, things like VoIP commissions and uh, subscription renewals for various products and that kind of thing. Okay. Joanna? Um, good morning, Joanna Sobrand. My company is MXO Tech. We're based out of Chicago. We're in the West Loop of Chicago, so we have a lot of competition in our area. Um, we've been doing managed services since about 2007, and we started the business in 2005. So a little over 10 years in business now. We, um, we're combined, our services are combined of um, managed services and application development. And since I've been in the group here, I've also changed our software development project work to monthly recurring revenue. So <clears throat> we've, um, we've been able to increase our um, managed services revenue. I believe we're now at uh, 190,000 a month and we started with application development. So that's right now about $20,000 a month. Something new that we did recently. I remember you starting, with, when you started with us, you were only about 20,000 a month in- 26,000 a month. In managed recurring revenue. Yeah. Where did you say you are now? 190 um, on the managed services side and about 20 on the application side. Okay, very good. Yeah, and last year was a slow year for us for some reason. So hopefully this year <laughs> we're going to be much higher. Okay. Um, but yeah, we did. We started at Producers Club uh, four years ago at 26000 a month. Yeah. Uh, and actually, Kaseya introduced me to you. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that. Bruce? Good morning. I'm Bruce McCulley. Um, my company name is Dynamic Edge. We did 5.2 million last year. Um, of that, 4.15 million was managed services. Um, How much of that did I contribute to? Yeah. <laughs> Let's Bruce think about that. No, yeah. so actually, yeah. um, before and we. And he does a great job. Before we met Robin, we had no managed services. We. Uh, um, I st started as apprentice group, and um, that's uh, when we started selling managed services. Um, so, uh, do the blueprint. That's what we did, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how we got started. So, definitely um, interesting stuff. Uh, you have two locations. Two locations. Thank you, Robin. Yeah. Do you, do you want to? No, make, I just like picking uh, on you. You know, a little bit. Have an <laughs> office in Detroit and one in Nashville, uh, Tennessee, and. Um, I'm going to hand the mic to somebody next. Okay, that's good. What's wrong, Bruce? I don't know. You're usually better <laughs> than this. Uh, I'm Dan uh, Isidoric, uh, also known as F Bomb Dan. Uh, we're outside of Detroit too, so Bruce and I are neighbors, but it's a it's a very large market. So um, we have been with Rob in 11 years, so it's been a long haul. Yeah. Um, uh, right now, we just finished our year out at just shy of uh, 1.9, and we're at uh, 149,000 in MRR. So, um, what else do I need to do? Is that it? I think that's about it. Cool. Yeah. 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 You, you hold the mic for that side. Yeah. Morning. Uh, my name is Mark Elliott. I'm the president and CEO of 3i International. Um, I'm probably the greenest IT guy in the room. Uh, my background comes from the managed print side of the business, doing document management workflow integration to ERP packages. And in 2010, Meg Whitman walked into a training class that I was doing, and she started talking about converged infrastructure. And the lights went off, and I said, oh my goodness, I am in the wrong business. And it took me about two years to transition, but I resigned from uh, my employer in April of 12, and in August of 2012, started 3i International. Uh, we just finished uh, 2016 at 10.7 million in revenue. Um, we do about 300000 a month in reoccurring right now, and that's split about 50-50 in between managed print and uh, managed services. So we, uh, we're trying to figure out marketing to, you know, draw in more IT contracts right now, and that's what brought us to Robin Robbins. Good morning. I'm Scott Spiro from Computer Solutions Group in Los Angeles, and we'll see, I started the business back in 96, kind of as a box shop, I guess. Um, and I've been with Robin for, gosh, I don't know, 2007 maybe? I think when we started we were maybe around a quarter of a million a year and we're about three and a half million now. Um, about 70% of that's managed services. Mm 
Okay, so just as you can see, very diverse group up here, um, different places across the country and uh, different levels in, in growing their business. So um, Scott, I'm gonna start with you this time. And what I wanna e go through each of you and find out is, what's, go back to when you first started selling managed services. And what's one or two, maybe three lessons that you wish you could go back in time and tell yourself then. So for anybody in the room who's kind of starting or struggling to sell, what's some lessons that you've learned in your journey? Well, I guess if I, 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 when I started doing managed services in 2008, um, I was um, involved with Ingram Micro in their seismic program. They were kind of feeling things out as well, and they had just created a partnership um, with Autotask and, and maybe um, just a few different vendors, and it was all new for everybody. And that, they had about three or four people working in that department. I think they maybe have about 400 now. Um, and I think looking back on it, if I could, I guess, tell myself, you know, going back, give myself some advice. Number one, it would be pick your vendors really, really carefully. Like, really do your due diligence. Some amazing vendors. Most of, most of them are at this event, I think. A lot of them are. Um, I think that you've done a good job at, at vetting those out for us. But a lot of vendors weren't so good, and that hurt. Um, I spent a lot of time throwing things up against the wall and managed services to see if it would stick, be it pricing or be it contracts or different arrangements. I mean, our scope of work has changed so much over the years. And uh, I spent a lot of time trying to look at what other people were doing and just kind of throw a pricing out based on what folks were doing. I didn't really have the, the background in business to understand how to do a deep dive and really look at how what my costs were and what it was going to take to run the, the service correctly. And we got burned a few times. And the other thing I would say is really figure out what your standards are and stick to them. Don't start working outside what your core competency, competency is or trying to do things that a client might be requesting that you do that were outside your original scope just to kind of please them. Um, I've gotten burned on that as well. It's much better to lay that out um, up front and say, hey, this is, this is what we do. If you want to do this, this just isn't our, our thing. And let me bring somebody else in that. Give me an example. That, we were working with a company that's a, a statewide um, juice company. <laughs> and I love their juice, to be honest, but they were really schmucks. <laughs> um, I don't go there anymore for my juice. <laughs> and um, they were quite in, they were really ingrained in, in Google, on uh, the Google platform. So, you know, Google Apps, Gmail, all that kind of stuff. And we're really Microsoft partners. And we can do the Gmail, we can do that. We're not great at it. Mm -hmm. And I think in retrospect, we should have said to them right up front, if you want to sign up with us, obviously you do. Here's what you're gonna need to do in order to make that happen, which means you're going to need to move over to um, Azure and Office 365 and all of that. And when they said, no, you know what, we really like this platform. So, you know, that's totally cool. Let me introduce you to somebody else mm -hmm. that is really, really has a deep bench on that. Because, frankly, we're just only so large. We can only spend so much time training on these various tools and services, and I can't do it all. Okay. just don't have the bandwidth, so that would be an example. Okay. How long ago did you transition to managed services? You said... Um... Mid-2012. Uh, mid okay, all right. So, pr pretty green. I haven't been doing it this long, you know, to, to know, to know what uh, needed to change. You know, I, I think really look at pricing structure and don't underprice yourself. If you're underpriced in the market, it makes it tough to scale. It makes it tough for the executives to work themselves out of the business to really be able to start to concentrate on what's strategic. Um, and I think really early in the sales process with customers, not only looking at your demographic, what your verticals are, but also looking at the psychographic of the customer. If they're not there to, to buy high value, uh, and they're not willing to pay the additional dollars to get great service, move on, move on quickly. And, and when you get people that are, are, are going to buy into that process, 
understand what your solution stack is, that you can convert them and you can give them a technology roadmap that says, hey, listen, we're gonna take over this account, but we're going to bring you into what our core process and our core technology is, where you have the technical proficiency to, to be a master at it versus having to be a jack of all trades. So when you look at the pricing, did you happen to look at the survey? I did. Is your pricing, do you think that's in line or you think it's too low, mm -hmm. just based on your opinion? So, so, so we're on the higher side of that, right? So, you, you know, we, when we started, and, and, and so we started with the acquisition of a small MSP that was less than a million dollars, and, and they had some break-fix clients, and we quickly went in there and, and we ran up their bills and converted them to a managed service contract and, and forgave the last month when they got sticker shock. And, and the ones that didn't want to convert, we, we fired them. And so at that point, we are on a per device type model. We've moved to per user. We still kind of kept the bronze, silver, gold. Uh, and, and so our gold, which is unlimited all in, um, it is 150 a user. But what we really started to do at this point is that we're now selling it at 200 a user, but we're giving a half hour per seat of on-site service. And, and we really use that to have somebody show up, you know, once a week, four hours, on-site, walk around. And, uh, you, you know, it's really bringing a, a lot of value and, and stickiness within the account. So we're, we're a little on the, the high side of that. Okay, okay. Dan? So, I would definitely mimic the uh, pricing comments because we all kind of, when we started, we, we were just happy to get something that was residual, at least was my uh, experience. Um, what I would say is if you haven't started, one main thing is just start, right? So that's the first thing. Um, and then if you're, when you do price it out, evaluate what your plan might look like in 12 to 18 months. So you might not be quite where you think you should be or want to be uh, or have the right uh, tool stack, so forth, but kind of project out what your cost will be because once you get down that line, that client does not really want to change their price if they're locked into a three-year. Um, the, the other thing is, uh, Scott touched on it, but I would say is do your heavy due diligence on vendors um, because the change after a Kaseya, a ConnectWise, anyone like that, it is a hell of a lot of money. And it's not about the money, it's about actually the change cost uh, with your team, the client understanding the interface and so forth. Let's see what else. Um, I would say there were times that prospects or clients would say, hey, you know, that's a little bit too much money. Can we just remove this? Can we do that? And in the early days, you do that stuff. But right away, that's a red flag that, uh, that you should probably walk away, even though you think you need the money. Because uh, then you find out later the effective rate on that client is shit. So what's the <laughs> point of doing work for free? Uh, so for me, there are two things that I would have told my younger self. Um, the first one is very simple, and it's just do what you say you're going to do. Always do what you say you're going to do. So if you're going to bring a new client on and you're going to eliminate their computer problems, make sure that you have enough pieces in your toolkit to eliminate their computer problems. And if they want to pick and choose, and you're not going to be able to do what you said you're going to do because they're pulling pieces out, you're going to have an unhappy customer, and those do not make very good referral engines. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's number one. Number two, get a good contract, okay? So um, you're getting started, you're really excited, you ask somebody how much to charge for this stuff, you got yourself a gold, silver, and bronze plan, um, and you get somebody to sign up, um, and your contract isn't very good. Um, now you have a real problem if they decide that they want out, or if they decide that maybe you're not doing what you said you were going to do. Whatever the case is, get a good contract. And um, I know that there's a couple of different sources for those. Um, ask around, see what other people are doing, but don't just take one of those other contracts and copy it. Take it to your attorney, make sure they look at it, make sure they're comfortable with it, because when there is a problem, you're gonna want your person to be familiar with the agreements that you have out in the field. Yeah, the only time a contract is really important is when 
there's a problem. You know what I mean? So yeah. you, you got to... Well, yeah. Exactly. But the problem that, that I've found over the years is that um, you may be doing what you said you're going to do, but some people are just crazy. And Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be talking later, yeah, Robert. Right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I try really hard to not be a total pain in the ass. I mean, I really do, because like, it's the last thing I need. Okay, You're still on the panel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, for us, few things. One is we put together an explanation of services. I think Scott alluded to this, and um, I know because I've shared mine with him. We put this together, and this was so important because... Previously, our support staff was including everything and anything. And so we were trying to figure out why is our project, um, why are our project revenues low? Well, that's because our clients were getting everything included in their support agreement. And our staff didn't really know because their job is to uh, be customer service oriented. And so they just say yes to everything. And until we came up with the explanation of services, and really rolled it out to our customers and rolled it out to our employees. Now everyone knows what the expectations are. And I don't think people mind. They just want to know. And when you're vague, they will ask to have everything included. So it's just the nature, right? Why would you want to pay for something if you can get it for free? Um, so that was one thing that was really important for us. Uh, second thing was measuring our effective rates at our um, monthly team meetings. Well, we do weekly team meetings, but at the end of every month, we look at all of our client effective rates and we have them categorized. We know that our hourly rate should be, let's say, 175 an hour, and some clients were at $26 an hour and some clients were at $300 an hour. So a couple problems with that. One, you don't want a customer that you're making $300 an hour for necessarily because you're not providing value, right? We want to be fair. We want to have a certain amount of profitability. And when you're making $350 per hour on a customer, clearly there's not a lot of value being provided to them. And then same if you're making $26 an hour on a customer, um, you, you're not making money. And so it kind of balanced out sometimes. But what we ended up finding out is that the small customers... Anytime there was one little problem that happened, their effective rate would go way down. And, and then we found out that some of these customers were really nice, but we weren't making any money on them. And so it gave us an ability to really measure and then communicate to our clients. Um, and then also understand what our pricing is. So that's been really helpful. And, our, and we share that with our entire company. So everybody on our team... Um, is aware of which customers are at certain points on their effective rates. And it's nice because then they're doing help desk support or networking support. They see, they know that this is a customer we're not making any money on. So they're looking, then we look to figure out why is that? What can we do to mitigate that issue? And then the third thing that I really like that um, is great from a, uh, when you sell a customer, I find that when you have a successful onboarding process with a client for the first 30 to 90 days is like your most critical point in time with a client because when you screw things up in the very beginning, it's really difficult to recover. And so we created this onboarding process and we documented everything. We put workflows in place so our whole team knows what to do. And we have a much higher um, client retention because of that. We start out on a great foot going forward, and um, we seem to really have uh, very happy customers because of that. So. so I think a lot of it just echoes what everybody else has said. Standards is huge. You know, it, it's, if you have a new client and they really don't want to use your antivirus, you know, that's kind of a non-negotiable. And, you know, they may not w want to spend $4,000 for a new firewall. Well, that's where you have to get creative in whether you include it and your rate goes up, whatever the case may be. Um, like Joanna said, knowing your numbers, you know, Robin says that all the time, but from the service side of it, um, you know, what is your effective rate? What are your people costing you? You know, that does a lot of things. Yeah, yes, it helps you from a business health standpoint, but it also helps you figure out why is this client taking so much time? You know, what's wrong here? Because it's not wrong over here. Um, 
And the big thing is just, you know, do what's right. Do what's right for your client. What would you want your vendor to do for you? You know, whether it's um, your landlord, whoever the case may be. And just always do what, what's right and over communicate. You know, there's nothing that's worse than signing a contract and the client calling you the next day and saying, so what do we do now? You know, for example, we have a what to expect document that they get immediately after they sign the contract that explains you know, when onboarding happens, what happens during onboarding, what to expect. Um, you know, just communicate, communicate, communicate with your clients. Okay. Now, the next question, anyone can grab this one, um, so we'll just go in any order. But uh, obviously, managed services, would you all agree it's gotten more competitive? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so what are you doing today to try and maintain your margins and differentiate yourself? It's become commoditized now. And when we started out, it was a differentiator, a really easy differentiator. And now, So how long ago when it was... Well, I mean, I, I would say that things started to change maybe five years ago. But, but in the past two years, it's really changed. We're no longer having to market uh, to prospects in focus on what managed services is and, and how it benefits them. They get that now. They're very well versed in it. They've already had probably multiple relationships of managed service providers by the time they, they get to us anyway. Mm-hmm. So, so now the differentiator is all about what we're bringing to the table as far as our strategic skills, our business acumen, how we're going to help them grow their businesses using technology as a, a mechanism to do that. But it's not talking generally about, hey, we use X virus protection tool or we yeah. use this. Nobody cares because they shit <laughs> anymore about that. <laughs> they expect that. Like, they expect you to walk in the door and have all of that really, really you know, solidly down. So now it's all about the business acumen. This is the quality that we bring to you from, from our team. Uh, you know, come and, come and you know, meet everybody. Uh, what are, what are so. customers asking for today that they might not have asked for before? Is it, like you're kind of touching on some of it, but is there anything that they're now, now that they're a savvier buyer, are they coming in and asking you for something? They're more focused on references, I think, than before even. Yeah. I would say today, when we talk to a customer, they already know what managed services are. They've already had two or three bad experiences. And what they're really interested in from us is how we intend to actually deliver the services. How are we actually going to make sure that their backups are happening every day? They want to know that stuff. Mm -hmm. And what we found is if we show them either by bringing them to our office and having them see (laughs) our processes in place, or if we bring them a copy of our manual and show them what we're doing, we, we have a lot better close rate than when we don't share that stuff. Okay. What else? I mean, for the rest of you, how are you differentiating? How are you? Well, for us, we were struggling with uh, being in Chicago. We have so many managed service providers and customers are very sophisticated. Our um, leads went down significantly over the last year. And we were trying to figure out what's going on, but there's just an abundance of people. So one of the things I did is I looked at inside of our business, what is it that we have that maybe another managed service provider doesn't have? And I think all of us have something unique within our business and only you know. So for us, it's the application side of uh, things where we have a full applications team, developers, um, project managers, QA. And what we found is customers were looking to not only have the managed IT services from, you know, backups, antivirus, but they were looking to incorporate applications to help them stand out from their competition, grow their business, um, help them generate more revenues, bring in sales. And so we merged applications and managed services together. So now when we started going to customers and talking to them about managed services, we immediately brought up that we we asked them if we could do a business process improvement assessment. And that means that we go in and we look at all of their software and how it all integrates into their company. Um, How is it impacting their sales, their operations, more on the strategic side. So immediately the conversation um, changed from 
the me too, me three managed service provider to, hey, this company can come in and really help us grow our business using technology. And so that's been a really successful differentiator for us. I worked with the accountability group on that uh, two quarters ago, and we've been able to acquire more customers and increase our revenue. So, and it could be anything. You guys have other services that you can, I'm sure, offer. It doesn't have to be software development. Anyone else in? Anyone in? So, so I think, you, you know, you look at the market and it's become very commoditized. And, and all the marketing messages that are coming from all the MSPs are generalities and platitudes. Everybody's out there saying that they've got great service. Um, we've been in business since 1942. You, you know, statements that become very platitudinal like that, right? And, and I think really shifting it to an executive conversation where you're going in and you're helping them identify deficiencies in technology, where their workflow is broken at, looking at business process and how that drives up the human capital expense in their business. And regardless of the widget that they're selling, convincing them that the core of their business is a technology company and that's what they need to leverage in order to be competitive. And, and when you start at that level and, and, and you get the belief from them that the wrong place to save money is with your attorney, your accountant, or your IT firm, then you have the ability to, to really bring in the margins that allow you to, to bring value uh, to that organization. And I think the other thing that we're doing, you see so many competitors that are coming in here and, and they're trying to turn the environment or upgrade the deficiencies in the environment and sometimes people are looking at six-figure price tags and people get sticker shock. And by using, you know, leveraging a, a cost per user model, we've been able to use financial instruments that will have like a term. So instance, it might say 60 months, this per user cost and, and this amount of bodies in the account. So if you have a, a hundred employee corporation a uh, $20 user bump, which doesn't seem very significant to the business owner, 20 more dollars per employee to fix your technology problems, funds 100 grand, and, and you can start to clean up a lot of messes with that. Uh, I would say what we did a few years ago was we really started focusing on more industry niches. Uh, by doing so, it got us to know the line of business apps for that, uh, those industries and make the prospect more comfortable because, uh, like Bruce said, uh, they've already been burned multiple times. They want to understand that. And then we talk more of on a business case level where we educate them on it's really in our best interest to confirm and, and work through and get you to a point where you have minimal issues, minimal downtime, because every time we touch a ticket, we're losing money in essence. And, we, and especially if they are coming from somebody that is a lower-end MSP where they're charging hourly or something like that, or even a break-fix model, then we'll kind of go down that discussion and educate them on, you know, those kind of uh, agreements and so forth. Uh, those companies want you to have issues where they can in incur hourly billing with you. So uh, that's one thing. One thing I didn't touch on earlier is kind of the effective rate discussion uh, was... At least in our company, we do profit sharing with the uh, engineering team, with the service team. So if, you know, if we take on an unprofitable account and we knew it in the sales team and we didn't do the audit process properly and we didn't dig in, then we really are hurting the entire team. Um, so it's, it's not just affecting sales. It's really a, a service ripple all the way down to everyone's paycheck. So just... You know, that's one of the things that, that made a change with us. We put uh, profit sharing in place years ago, and it really got the service team looking at things differently. And it might sound silly, but, you know, they now they think, hey, maybe we should disable this hosted exchange mailbox because it's going to trickle down to us. Maybe we should clean up these extra agents that we don't need that we're paying for. Oh, I forgot to leave this uh, storage craft license activated, whatever it may be. It, it kind of changes that mindset. And once they start getting the checks, uh, we do it every six months. It's, it it kind of makes the team, you know, look at it a little bit differently. Okay. And Willie, you're in a smaller market. So are you seeing the same in sh at like Chicago, LA and the other... You know, or do people know what managed services are? Or? They don't know the term managed services, but they know that they pay a flat fee for their computer support. And yeah, you got to take it to a business decision. Ultimately, you know, the way I approach it is 
I, we talk about what's going to make them more productive and what's going to make them more profitable, and we leave the nerd out of it. I mean, it's not about technology. It's about, you know, what's best for their business, what's going to make them more productive and ultimately make them more money, which is what we do. Just, just one other comment. Um, you always have to ask if you want something. And what I mean by this is um, we're talking about... Um, we're talking about clients as kind of adversarial a little bit right now. And um, we're talking about, you know, do you want to spend $100,000 to clean up or stabilize an environment? And if you, if you put your tech hat on, you're always kind of nervous to say, hey, we need to do this $100,000. It's going to make your team function better. And if you're not doing that, if you're not asking for it, they're not going to spend it. And you... Looking back over time, this has been something I've really been educating my team on, and this is something that I personally have to work on sometimes, is just saying, hey, we need to do this. This is how much it's going to cost. And if you don't do this, here's a risk acceptance form that you can fill out, and anything that we have to do that touches this is going to be hourly. And that's been very effective. So just one other piece to share with that. Okay. Now, um, when you're, do any of you still have break fix clients? A few. A few. Um, so no, 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 no break fix. Okay. Um, talk about like your decision to do that because I don't know that you know I've talked to some very successful MSPs that do some project and break fix work, um, and. I guess, tell me how that conversation went. Because how many of you in here still have break fix clients? Okay. And how many of you would love to get them on a managed services agreement? Okay. So when, what advice would you give them? Like, how do they go have that conversation with their customer? Like, what should they do to prepare to have it to be productive? And then do you think they should cut bait and say forget it? Or do you think that they should say, well, we'll pick and choose and we'll keep some? So what, just thoughts on that. So when I started with Robin four years ago, um, all of our clients were break and fix. And I was really frustrated because we weren't as profitable and our staff was frustrated. We didn't have great staff retention. Um, it was causing a lot of problems for us. We, didn't, we weren't really good at break and fix, I guess, was the problem. And maybe some people are good at it, so um, this wouldn't apply to you. But... We, um, we ended up taking, I took, I looked at every single customer's financials and what they spent with us over the 12 month period. And then I found out where do I wanna be from a managed services standpoint, um, you know, per seat or per user. And I found that about 50% uh, percent of our clients were already spending the same amount money um, monthly if you were just to amateurize it over a 12 month period, right? Because some months were like they were spending 5,000, some months 1,000. But if you take that on an average, I found that they were already paying um, what a managed services could offer them. And then I put together a, and then I looked at all the customers. I read that book, The Pumpkin Plan, and we looked at, you know, which customers did we want to keep and which customers, um, weren't a good fit for our business from a cultural standpoint. And so then I went and met with the bigger customers in person, kind of like what Bruce is saying. You just have to have a conversation with people. Sometimes it's because they don't know and you have to educate them, right? Because you're the expert. And so a lot of times some of you may be afraid to have that conversation, but maybe that's exactly what the customer is looking for. So I met with um, the larger customers and then the smaller ones, I just sent them letters and I put all the benefits in there of why we're gonna be switching over to a monthly fixed plan. And so within, um, within a short amount of time, I don't remember exactly, but maybe- about three months. Yeah, within about- really Quick. Yeah, it was yeah, it was fast. We put everything together. So within three months, we converted all of our clients to managed services, every single one of them. And the ones that didn't want to be converted, we ended up releasing them to the other managed service providers or break and fix providers. And they weren't really good clients for us to begin with. So how many was that? How many did you lose? Roughly? Twelve. We we let go of twelve smaller clients. But what was really interesting that happened to us, we 
we became a lot more profitable because the 12 pitas that we let go were costing us all that time and money. And then we brought in, I think, I don't remember the numbers exactly. I did, I did a genius article on it. But then we brought in like six new clients because we created the space that were like three times the amount of revenue. So, and, you know, we improved our morale in our company. Um, we were a lot more profitable. We had a lot more control. We weren't getting the monthly ups and downs of income. I mean, everything changed for us. So my advice is just take the plunge, do it. Read the pumpkin plan if you um, need some inspiration. He talks about how when you have um, a bunch of little pumpkins, the big ones can't grow, right? They're like rotting the, the other ones. So you got to make space for those bigger customers that um, are better fit for you. So the probably 7% of break-fix clients that we currently have, we really have because it is the best relationship for us and for them. That could be because they have internal IT that we just occasionally supplement or for a number of different reasons. But, you know, ultimately, yeah, this is the same thing. When you decide to make that plunge or, or you know, convert everyone or, you know, 90% or greater of your clients to that, um, you, know, you are contractually obligated to service your contract clients before your break fix clients. And yes, when somebody calls with a problem, it's instinctive that we want to help, but you got to make them feel a little pain sometimes, you know, that w we had to do that. But for the most part, you know, everybody got it. I mean, they just, you know, you know they did. It's all about, you know, it, just like Robin does, it's showing value, you know, and a lot of times they don't know. It's not that they're necessarily opposed to it, but you just you know, haven't sold they don't it know. The, the yeah. same with like what Bruce and Dan were saying, um, you know, yeah, they may need a hundred thousand dollar project to get them stable. Um, you have it in your head that they're not going to do it. They don't know that they, I mean, you know, if you go, yeah, whatever we need to do to, you know, make more money, let's do it. And, you know, you've been throwing up this mental roadblock that, oh, they're never going to do that. It's too much money. You know, you just can't, you know, it's, it's what's in their best interest. And you can help clients as well. So, like, we, uh, speaking of having good vendors, we built a relationship with Great American Leasing. And when we have a $100,000 project, we offer them a lease agreement. And a big percentage of people take us up on it and they'll do it. So you have to kind of be helpful to them to make it work because they want a solid, safe network. It's something that's going to bring in efficiency for their business. So yeah. just get creative. Right. What else? Break fix? Switching break fix? How'd you have that conversation? So um, we were doing about two and a half million dollars in break fix and we... Uh, well, we, we ran into a situation. One of our largest clients was Borders. And they were spending about a million dollars a year with us. And we... As a break fix? Uh, yeah, Border. contract, break yeah. fix, project mm -hmm. work. And they, as you guys know, sold their on-site presence to Amazon, which is kind of a little mistake, um, and went out of business. And when they went out of business, they took about a million dollars off of our top line and we had to figure out what to do real quick. And what we ended up doing is we ended up learning how to sell managed services. We went to every new customer that came in the door and we sold managed services to them. And I, didn't, I was too nervous to go to our existing customers because I, I didn't want to lose any of those folks. And I had a lot of head trash about, this is how much I want to make per uh, engagement. And my, I, I didn't have Joanna's situation where my break fix clients were spending even close to what I was charging these new customers. And so I had to go have a conversation with them and it um, did not go that well. Um, we ended up keeping about 25 to 30% of them when we decided to just go completely manage services with no break fix. And um, two things happened. The first one is we were able to standardize. So instead of teaching my team or having what I call cowboy IT guys that just kind of know how to fix everything, we were able to focus in and really train our team on really specific 
tools and then have people specialize in individual areas because we knew what kind of work was going to be coming in the door because we had standardized customers. So that was a big step for us. And the other thing was is we got rid of the, the revenue roller coaster mm -hmm. and that allowed us to plan capacity a lot better, which allowed us to not have a whole bunch of capacity sitting on the bench all the time and that really allowed us to become a lot more profitable. Uh, for us, we had the discussion kind of like everyone already said up here where we kind of just went through and let them know the benefits that are going to be coming down the line with the improvements that we were doing. We were flat rating everything. The reason actually I went to manage services was a couple things. Uh, it was about 10 years ago too. Uh, first thing was Robin was beating it into my head a little bit. And then secondly, I had a client come to me and said, you know, Dan, I'm not really a fan of this up-down roller coaster on my billing, you know, 2,000 here, 5,000 the next month, 4,000 here. They said, we really need fixed fee. So we went down that road, we uh, got that in place, um, and, and we used them as a case study when we went to the other clients and said, you know, we did this because this other law firm asked for this. And we laid out all the benefits and so forth and used them as uh, somebody that they could reach out to if need be. So that, that was very helpful. Um, we didn't cut and run. We didn't, you know, go through and say, you know, if you're not with us, then move on. Uh, I have a couple friends in this room that have done that. And, you know, there's a different way to, to uh, strategize around that. My, my uh, uh, mindset on that at this point is what we do is we still get a lot of those small clients, uh, but we actually just send them off to a, a smaller uh, competitor and we just, they give us a referral fee. So it works out quite well. Um, so, I, I mean, they don't, you know, in the beginning we did, like Joanna, we looked at the annual, the average spend, we bumped it up a little bit. Uh, and kind of the, the point we were talking about earlier, that still wasn't enough for what we expected to deliver. But to put it in, in you know, at my mindset at the time, I literally sold my first uh, managed services deal while I was running a demo of Kaseya. So we were really figuring it out in the early days, um, but it's been fun. Got to start, right? Want to give him the mic? Are, are you getting attached to the mic? You're like, <laughs> you're, it you're like yeah, it's frozen. Yeah, Let it go. Okay. You know... I think yeah. there's two sides to this You just got coin. it, right? Okay, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. So, so, so I think there's two sides to this coin. And, and I think if we start with the customer-facing side of this coin, and, and I think this really mirrors what's been said on this panel, there's a capacity issue, right? We can't staff the, the best technical minds if the revenue coming on the door is on the come. And, and so we've taken this a step further, is that we've started to take people into contracts. And, and so many of our competitors are out there pitching 30-day outs. They're, they're pitching one-year contracts. And I said, listen, if you want me to come in here and staff and deliver you the best service, you want world-class service, you want us to be at your beck and call 24-7, 365, give us a five-year contract. We'll give you a 90-day out if there's a performance issue or, or we do not live up to what we're said, you can get out at any time but I need your commitment for three to five years so I can staff and support you. On our side of the coin, and if you're in this business and you want it to be more than a lifestyle business, you've gotta have long-term contractual agreements for it to be worth anything. So my last employer before starting 3i, I did a startup in Florida and we literally grew from zero to 100 million. Then they sent me to Texas to do it again and, and we took a $1.8 million business and grew it to $36 million before I resigned. Part of that business was organic growth, but a lot of it came by acquisition. And, and really getting in there and digging to go, okay, how many times earnings can we purchase a business for? And coming from that world, it was four to five times EBITDA is, is what you would purchase that business for. But a lot of us moving towards cloud, whether we're looking at, at a SaaS model or infrastructure as a service, right? You can see that start to sell for, for 10 times what, what that monthly reoccurring portion is. But if I, as a, a business owner coming to acquire a company and they've got 30 day outs, it, it's, it's not worth anything. And, and so I think from our standpoint, for us to, to move people as it is to their advantage to get better service and support into longer term contracts with less outs. Scott, go back to break fix too. How did you transition your customers? Start there and then you can add on to that. Okay. Um, 
it, was, it wasn't something that we did overnight. It was something that we did over time. So um, it's, I don't think you have to drop your clients and just move instantly to manage services. I think you need to figure out where it is that you envision your company, where you, you want to be, what your future is. And I pivot off what you said. Is it a lifestyle business for you? Is it something that you, you want to grow? Yes. If you bring on more managed services and um, those multiples ultimately could, could spell a better out for you, um, there's no doubt. But at the same time, maybe you have break and fix plus customers and, and they're not going to move to managed services. They may never move to managed services. There are some companies that are very happy with their break and fix. And so by you deciding where it is that you want to be, I think that that kind of from the top down will help you make a decision on, on what to do. And um, yeah, I, I, think, I think that a lot of times we, we spend time here in this room talking about what our top line revenues are. It's a vanity metric. Don't worry about what our, what our metrics are. Uh, there's so much knowledge in this room. Uh, most of the things that we've done implemented at CSG that have helped us grow have been from folks here. And um, whether you decide, I was going to say, keep this in mind that I think we can all agree that there's a different cadence between managed services and break and fix. They're totally different. Break and fix is completely reactive, uh, and our managed services are proactive, and they, they, it's very tough to operate those at the same time with the same people. And so if you decide, my advice is that if you decided that you wanted to continue to offer managed services and break and fix, you would have to break those out into perhaps separate teams. And I do know folks that have been quite successful doing that. But if you don't have that sort of bandwidth at this point, or you decide you don't want to get involved in that, which is what my decision was, then yeah, go, go a separate route. But um, I'm looking to grow my business uh, and, and continue to, to grow it. And so managed services for me was a, was a logical step. Okay. Yeah. To, yeah. I, and you know, when I was doing the uh, Million Dollar Earners series, I interviewed a number of CEOs that had, were growing, or had companies that were 10 million, up to like Mont Phelps, who's 400 million. He was, I think, the largest C, the company, the largest CEO company I uh, interviewed. And there were some that, that still do break fix, believe it or not. And they're doing 15, 20. There was one out in the Midwest and he was 30 million still doing break fix. And that was just his philosophy. He said, we do manage services, but we still do break fix and we're profitable. And so I think it's, you can, I, I know a lot of people that are pure play managed services and they're broke. Like to Scott's point, top lines for vanity, bottom lines for sanity. So whatever model you choose, I've, I've met some people who are selling to home users and are more profitable than B2B managed service providers. So, you know, just the, I think you have to figure out the model. And what I do, I'm glad to see you guys are at the mics because I do want to, let's, if you guys want to start uh, asking questions, I'm not sure who was first. Okay. Well, all right. We'll go over here first then. The gentleman before Scott, you were saying uh, three to five wow. year deals if you want world class service. Then you said 90 day out. I'd like some clarity on that. Does that mean 90 days from the beginning of the contract or at any time during the contract? Sure. So, you know, as we look to re reduce risk, for the end user, right? They're, they're going, well, we don't want to commit five years. Uh, what, what if you have bad service? So I think you can always put a performance clause in there that says that if you do not perform and, and, and meet your obligations, that they can write you a 90-day cancellation letter. At any time during the agreement. Absolutely. I was going to say, we do, we do the same thing. And, and there's a benefit for you, too, because if you get locked into a three- to five-year deal with somebody and they turn out to be a complete idiot, you want to be able to exit as well. Yeah. So it goes, it goes both ways. The only downside is we've had experiences where people will kind of pull anything out of a hat. Uh, you didn't provide um, this report that you said that you would, so we're executing a 90-day out. I've had that happen. And you know what? Be careful what you promise. We, we've removed some things. Okay, great. So I'm just curious. Uh, five of you up there are doing all managed services. Is that complete, all in, all you can eat? Or is there a hybrid? I'm providing for all of my clients some managed service pieces, but yet some of them still want certain things that are outside that to be on a prepaid support block hour arrangement. And yet they're all getting monitoring. Some of them are getting firewalls. Some of them are getting... So there, there's a hybrid piece, and I'm wondering how you folks are handling that. Uh, at least for us, we have three tiers. So, but the base tier is still 
managed services, all the monitoring and so forth, but, and then the hourly would be, you know, the labor would be billable on that. And then the other thing, I don't know if we're, no one's really touched on it, but you, you know, keep in mind that uh, you, the CSP portion, right, cloud. So uh, I think everyone up here does that too. So that would be another offering, right? So you still do projects. Like, I mean, there's managed services, but then in all of your, I mean, even Bruce, like yeah. if there's a project that we, that's on top of the managed services. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So one thing that has changed over the years for us is we've gotten really clear about when something becomes a project. And we've been able to communicate that to our team. So in our case, it's three fives. If it's gonna take five hours, if it's gonna impact more than five users, or if it's more than five tasks, that's a project. And we're going to come to you with a project proposal for that work because it's outside of your managed service agreement. Okay. Yeah, anyone else want in on that? No? Yeah, I have some questions from virtual. Doc had one, but it was very similar to what you guys just said, and so I think he got that answered. But um, Dave Wolf, he was asking about how you engage new clients um, if you're not offering break fix to help with a client that's calling in with an emergency. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I mean, I think that at least at some point in time, you're going to probably, if you've been in business long enough, going to have somebody call and say, hey, my server's on fire and the guy we use is out of town. I've got people who need to work. What can you do? And you know, at least for us, this may not be the case for everybody. It does go back to um, do what's right. You know, and yes, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we do our best to help them. But again, you know, we're contractually obligated to help our other clients. But you know, in those situations, there has to be a very clear understanding, you know, up front that you know, while we'll do what we can to put the fire out today, um, we have to do it as Bruce said, with the scope of work, you know, we have to do that from insurance errors and emissions standpoint, and that, you know, we have to continue to engage with you. So there has to, even if something is on fire, um, you know, whether it's a 30 minute conversation that you go have the next hour or whatever the case may be, you know, you still can't deviate a whole lot. And, you know, the, that's the other thing too with a break fix that, you know, a lot of people don't realize insurance we're, we're we live in a sue happy society and you know that's a that's a way that we have also used to transition people is you know even if we do break fix you've got to sign an agreement you know justin says that so mm -hmm. yeah so for us um we have a short-term agreement we have them sign we don't charge them for the work that we came out and did. I probably Somebody's gonna kick me off the stage in a minute. Um, but uh, we go out, we fix them far enough to be able to do an audit of their network, and then we go in and sell them managed services. So we'll take them on and go and get them operational, like Bruce is saying, but we got burned a couple times. People don't wanna pay their bill because they go, oh my God, I didn't think it would be that many hours. So we learned our lesson and we asked for two and a half thousand dollar uh, deposit up front. If they don't use all the hours, we credit it gladly back to them. Um, but that's just what's worked for us. That's a lot of wisdom in that. that uh, thank you. <laughs> you. You know, I, th I think it's an opportunity for conversion. It, it, it's really a sales opportunity. You, you know, we had something that happened a few months ago and uh, somebody down on the ship channel called us. A uh, call came in at 11 o'clock. We'd been courting them uh, for managed services. Uh, deal hadn't gone through yet, but they called us at 11 and their process is that they had to get us a PO uh, before we could come on site. They got it to us at one o'clock in the morning and we had somebody on site at 3 a.m. Uh, by the time that they got to work, their, their servers were back up. We charged them two ninety five an hour and, and we brought the bill to them. And um, we ended up converting the account and we, we, we ate the bill, right? And so they didn't have to pay that, but, but it really helped with conversion. And, and I think break fix opportunities are, are great. I wish we could get more of them. And, and it really comes down to sales process and, and putting those people in your pipeline if they don't immediately convert. Mm -hmm. We do our best to ascertain if we think there's a managed services opportunity there. If we think that there is, then we'll go ahead and we'll get them to sign off on an order and we'll go and, and do the work. But if we think that there's not, and we, or they're too small or they don't, whatever the reason is, then we, we pass. Okay. 
Um, so, Dan, you were talking about profit sharing. And so do any of you, I know you're all, you know, operationally mature businesses, et cetera. Do any of you follow a great game of business and do open book management? We went down that path. Uh, it's open all of management, but there's this, there's certain things that I, I don't know. We didn't. I'm not. I'm not always the best at going through and getting shit started. You know, going from start to finish. You know, because I got that shiny penny issue. Yeah. Um, but it. I found that some of the team members were kind of wondering. You know why? Why am I not getting paid more? All that. So it, we just we keep it inside in a management. I'm sorry. What was your name again? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, for us, we we open up quite a bit to our. So we have our management team, and we we have our strategic goals for the year, and we. That's how we figure out what we're, what we're gonna, what we want to execute on, and we do have a profit sharing program for our engineers as well to encourage them to. Um, to be more efficient, and they can see who the clients are, they see how much we charge those clients, they see what the margins are on those clients, and um, you know, it took a while before I was kind of open to that idea, but I was encouraged to do so, and it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a good thing, and, and we share a lot, we have a, we have a monthly um, kind of a town hall meeting where we share with our team um, where we're at as a company, what our goals are. Um, it's, I think it's been good to get everybody aligned on what overall we're trying to do and where we're suffering a little bit too. Okay. Right. We share everything with our team. They have the uh, two-page business plan in front of them that shows our profitability, shows our top line targets. They're very involved in setting them and that's everybody from um, somebody that's going on site to fix a computer to um, our CFO. Oh, so it's the whole company, it's just open? Affirmative, yep. and loss, yeah. Thank you. Okay. I have two questions, if that's okay. Um, first question is related to projects. How are you guys clearly differentiating what that's going to be to the customer so that they don't come back and say, well, why are you charging me for this? I thought that was included in our managed service flat rate plan. Uh, yeah, in order to, for us, in order to have a um, all you can eat plan, you have to be very clear about what's not included in that plan. And that five, five, that five thing I mentioned earlier is how we explain it to them. And then we go through a couple of scenarios with them so that they have a full understanding. I think we need to stop saying all you can eat from, as an industry, you know, because first of all, you don't eat IT. So I don't know what the <laughs> hell that, where that came from. And then I think, you know, it is, I mean, to say it's an, it kind of gives in, and I think it, because how our language and what we say to ourselves is important. So you've got to get out of the mindset that it isn't all you can eat. It is, a comp we have a comprehensive plan, but, but no managed services. I mean, the amount of money you'd have to pay someone if it was truly wide open, you know. So I think um, just maybe I'll start a movement and we'll stop the all you can eat because y'all need to be on a diet, right? Because it's getting a little crazy. Yeah, because even flat rate doesn't make sense because it's truly not flat rate. At some point, there may be a project, a new server or something that's going to cost them more money or they're opening a new office that's going to cost them money to move the computers. So, you know, we've had a couple situations where we had to install three or four computers and they balked because... I sent them a bill for it. They're like, oh, that was supposed to be included. So now we include ones and twosies, and I do put that verbiage in the agreement, but we kind of had to eat at that time. So I'm, yeah, I'm still kind of curious if anybody else okay, clearly right. defines something in their agreement or how do they portray that to the customer. So one of the things I talked about is having the explanation of services first, right? So we include, the way I think about it is the managed services plan that they originally signed is more of a maintenance type agreement. And any moves and changes have different definition. So some of the stuff we could include, like what Bruce is saying, something that maybe takes less than five hours. But we will include for every 10 users, we include one new um, device set up per month. So if we have a 30 user environment, they get up to three new user machines set up for that month. So if they want to add five machines that month, they have to pay 
for the two additional ones, or they could wait to the next month, right? Because we don't want to overwhelm our staff. Um, and then the other thing is, it sounds like your customer didn't get a quote prior to getting billed for that. So you have to set some expectation up front where you give a quote to that customer, letting them know, by the way, based on our explanation of services, this isn't included. Here's what that setup and that cost is going to be. And then once they sign off on it, then we do the project because you want to avoid surprises. Are you putting a quote together before you do it or you just do the work and bill them? No, they sign the quote with the hours on it. That's so they're signing a quote with the hours on it and then coming back and saying yeah. why did, later? Did you only have, have hours and not the total cost underneath? So we had the machine on there and then I had a fixed fee. We charged three hours per machine um, at $100 an hour lowest rate. So they signed it and then when I billed them for it, they looked at it and they were like, oh, well, why are we being billed to install the machine? And I said, well, you signed the quote. Did you not look at it? I didn't say that, but... No, they read, they read the quote, they knew what it said, and they yeah. didn't want to pay you. That just sounds That's like a miscommunication there, yeah. with a customer. I mean, most people, if they sign off on something, agreeing to it, they remember that that's what they agreed to. So, I don't know, maybe this is a one-off. Yeah. So, I, I have one other question. Everybody's moving over to managed service plans, they're off a of break fix, but in my opinion, if you're putting them on a monitoring type of plan, it's really a break fix client because everything comes out hourly. Maybe you give a couple hours a month or something like that. So are you all truly managed service only or do you have monitoring customers that you're moving your lowest end customers to or you know, customers that just don't you know, meet your true flat rate plan? Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of a semantics of definition. You know, to me, break fix means something breaks and then you fix it. Um, we do have some who are monitoring only and then, you know, they either buy block hours or whatever the case may be. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, we do have a few of those. I think you just got to keep in mind that the more you, the more little subtleties you have as far as how you do your billing introduces more complication into your agreements, which then introduces more admin time and costs for you to actually make sure that you're doing everything correctly. So sometimes it just makes more sense to uh, just include things because it actually ends up costing you less to do so. So do you have like a monitoring plan or what, what are you guys doing? That, that, that's, I we guess have a, well, we, have a, we do have a plan that's, um, that's just the monitoring element, but to be honest, first of all, not many people pick it. And second of all is we actually run into some problems with companies that do, uh, say, we, say um, we monitor your network and we monitor your servers. Well, the next thing you, problem you run into is folks saying that there's a problem with the server that's then affecting the users. And so now we're out doing help desk support because somebody can't log into Active Directory, right? And so it becomes a kind of a, a hole that never ends. And so we find that those contracts aren't really that great, right? I mean, yeah. We used to uh, have a monitoring plan and we're working to eliminate it across the board for those specific reasons. If you don't have one don't create one, my thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on the other side of this. So we have the monitoring only plan and I, I look at effective rate, they are actually the most effective, or the highest effective rate contracts. Um, but to Scott's point, I'm crystal clear that every hour is billable. It doesn't matter what it is. And if they fret about it, then we get them off it. But I think, I don't know who said it, but uh, most clients today, new clients, they do not sign up for that plan also. They're more legacy ones, and we do get a few, but most of them are more the not all you can eat, uh, all inclusive. What do you want to call it now? I will come up with something. Okay. We do technical staffing too, and that can be way more profitable than some of the other things. I mean, it's, there's no r right way or one way to do yeah. this. Um, and it depends on the size of your business, what your acumen is how large of a company you are, where you are geographically. I think all of those play into what types of agreements you come up with. And for the longest time, we've had just one agreement. Mm -hmm. we, we also had one agreement, and that caused us a problem. Um, I started talking to Robin about it because I wasn't converting as many leads. And so two things, for those of you that, who are looking to go from break and fix to managed services, you can offer a custom, or you're looking to acquire new managed services clients, we started offering three different types of plans. One is the network only, one is a remote only, and then one is the on-site and remote plan. And so the conversation changed from that prospect to 
you know, going with that one plan or the other two competitors, right? So they started comparing us to the other ones versus kind of turning it around and saying, should I pick A or B? So you're getting that no off the table and it's just a better sales strategy. And the, the other thing is too, sometimes a customer doesn't want to make that financial commitment. So if you have a, a lower like entry point, right? And then you prove yourself, if you truly do a good job, then they can always upgrade to that higher level plan. So that's what we did as well. That was very helpful for us. Yeah. And you know, the other thing is never take like one instance with a customer and think that everything's broken because there's always going to be weirdos, the mm-hmm. customers that do weird things. It, you know, it doesn't mean everybody's like that. So, um, I, you know, because I see that a lot when people, they yeah. have like, they'll give me one scenario that happened one time and now they think they have to re-engineer everything. And maybe, and maybe, maybe there is. Maybe there's a little more clarification. You create a process. But, you know, you're always going to have, I think, the wayward customer who doesn't want to pay a bill or who pushes back on something or there wasn't, this wasn't clear. And so, you know, you just build your processes that way. And the other thing I'll say, I mean, I have reviewed more managed services contracts probably than most people in this room. I mean, I've seen hundreds of them. And they're all slightly different and different people have different philosophies. I mean, you're even hearing on the panel. So I know everybody wants, well, just tell me the one that's the best way to do it. What's the right way to do it? But there really are multiple ways that you can approach, whether it's monitoring only, as long as you have a strategy of, okay, we, we, if we sell this, then we have to be really clear on what we're, we're doing and what's billable and, you know, and if, you know, or if you don't do it, why, you know, so I, there's a lot of different ways that you can be right about this. And I think it comes down to really think about it this way, you know, I, like as me as a marketing consultant, well, I could have a panel of other marketers up here and we would disagree on how things should be done. Clients hire me because they want my advice. You know, and I'm, I, you know, I, each one of us as an expert has an opinion of how something should work based on our experience, based on our belief systems, based on our methodology, our strengths. So you have to also remember each one of you, you know your customers better and you know your own personal strengths and you got to kind of, you know, manage it or create your managed services offering based on that. I mean, get, get input from other people, but also trust yourself. In, in what you think is best for you and the client. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yep, okay. Let's go over here. Uh, for those of you who have moved to a, uh, a per-employee uh, price model, <clears throat> uh, what are the common uh, sort of other surcharges or flat fees that you're charging in addition to the per-employee? <clears throat> So I think just as in any managed service contract, um, all the ancillaries, all the project work are, are, are add-ons, right? And, and so when you use Great America for financing, everything can be reduced to a, the least common denominator, right? And, and so being able to go back and say, well, this is just X more dollars per user, and you sign an addendum, uh, that, that funds for those services there. But just as in any agreement, all that project work, uh, the three fives, if you will, is all an addition that goes on top of that. So I, I suppose, like the flat fee item. So for instance, if, uh, if you have a customer and you're charging a per employee uh, price and they have, for instance, a much heavier infrastructure than a common, uh, common customer, do you, uh, per office, uh, so they have, maybe they only have 20 employees, but five offices. I mean, that's a, that's a heavier sort of management scheme. Yeah, so in that scenario, we did learn that lesson. And we, because uh, we originally did per device, then we went to per user, and we started evaluating how many locations. Mm-hmm. Uh, another factor that played into there was we started to see some trends where people had uh, multiple devices. So uh, we put an allotment in for, uh, say there's 100 users. Uh, we'll put an allotment in for 25% above that on devices. So they'll get 125 devices uh, for that 100 users. After that, then there's a calculation for fees because, as you all know, we have a cost per endpoint. So um, that's, that's what's worked for us. And infrastructure? Uh, servers, uh, uh, like say a customer has 10 servers instead of, uh, you know, two for a, uh, for a small office or something. 
I was just going to say in that case, you know, my cost per, well, and, and I guess just as a blanket statement, my cost per employee may not be the same between company A and company mm -hmm. B yeah, because so. company A has two servers and company B has 10 servers, a mm -hmm. hundred dollars per user over here. And, you know, 18 applications, if you deal with any CPA firms that are huge and, you know, and they've got 10 VMs, yeah, you know, they're $170 a user. So no across the board stuff. We charge per user and then we charge per server. And if they have five locations, we charge a network management fee per location. Makes it easy. Mark, did you want it? Well, and again, this is going back to, to taking it to the least common denominator. When people get used to paying $250 per head or $300 per head, depending on, on what that infrastructure stack looks like, right, that, that can, can be more. But when they add 10 employees and you come back with a contract addendum that says that's $300 an employee and, and they sign up for another three grand, then you bring the services and deliverables that are behind that, whether it's, it's desktop or, or more infrastructure and what needs to be done and, and just make it simple for them. We found that not every client fits a per user model. If you walk in, like kind of what you were alluding to, if you go into a manufacturing company or something like that, they might have 20 employees, but then they've got a warehouse or multiple warehouses, and they've got a ton of devices there. And unfortunately, you've got some companies like, you know, Microsoft will charge you a per, per user price, but you've got RMM companies that will charge you a per, de, per, per device amount. And so it becomes, um, you know, problematic. So we don't, we, we go with the user if we can, but it doesn't always fit. Right. Okay. Thanks. Great. So um, two of you, I believe, talked about eating some cost on a break fix. Could you kind of explain that? Is that only after a conversion to a managed service or what? Well, so that was, one of those people was me. And um, basically, we don't, we don't have the tools in place to support somebody that's break fix. And what I mean by that is my guys are not on the help desk. Our, when a phone call comes in, it goes directly to our help desk so that when a client calls in for help, they're talking to an engineer right away. Right. They are not geared to take a credit card number and get a deposit and all this other stuff. They're geared to help people. And so they will immediately start helping that person and pulling information out to create a lead because we look at, at a situation of server on fire, et cetera, et cetera, as an opportunity. And so what they do is they gather enough information to qualify whether or not this is a potential client for us. If it is, we will go on site and stabilize them so that we can do an audit with them in the following week. That's how we do it. And that stabilization step, we, we don't usually, actually we don't bill for. What about the other guy there? Um, Mark, is it? I think he talked about that as well. So, so let's, let's take an example. Uh, somebody calls in and their server's down. And, and you go out there and you perform four hours of work and charge them $800. And, and they get the bill. You sell the advantages of proactive service and support and say, listen, you can pay this $800 bill or you can pay 400 right now and we're going to put you on a three-year contract. And we'll, we'll gladly eat that $800 to take a three-year agreement. Yeah, okay. That's what I thought. Thank you. Okay. And the people who are at the mic, these will be the last questions, okay? I'm going to have to go a little quicker. Uh, first, thank you no, all you for can, sharing you your knowledge. There. That's what I'm saying. The people that are standing it. Go ahead, Dan. You can stay there. All right. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, <laughs> Guys, thank you for sharing your knowledge. I wanted to compound on the gentleman that was up here before me and just ask you if any of you have found any successful tools that you would like to share for tracking your effective rate amongst the disparaging uh, price per seat that y'all have spoken to among your clients. Uh, your PSA should be doing this for you. Um, ConnectWise is capable. Uh, we have a, a portal that we've built out that does it, but your PSA should have it. Is, what, are you using a PSA tool? Yeah, yeah, we're using Autotask, and, and we've got some built into it, but when we start looking at our cost of goods sold, which is tracked in a different system, it's in our accounting system, we don't use our, we aren't pushing all of our accounting through our PSA, so. Do you, do you have a discipline problem with your team getting tickets in and tracking their time to those tickets and to the devices? No, not at all. Okay. And if you want to find me, we're auto task too, and I'll, we can discuss that a little bit yeah, great, at lunch or afterwards. Okay. 
Thanks. All right, so final question. This will be an easy one. Uh, appreciate you guys being here. Employer staffing levels, I heard you guys talk about your revenue and, uh, and sales models, but can you share with us how many bodies you guys are employing to pull that off? So I can tell you from our end, um, one, two, three, four, five, 10 altogether, um, six of which are engineering probably, and the others are, you know, and not counting myself, uh, the others are administrative, and I don't, I count myself as executive. Um, the others are administrative, marketing, accounting, et cetera, et cetera. Just how many employees do we have? How, is that what you want to know? Where do you go? Yeah, how many employees? So what's your revenue and how many? Just say your revenue and then how many employees again. Okay, um, 4.2 million and 29 employees. Uh, we're at uh, 5.2 and we have 39 employees. Um, yeah. Do you remember all their names? <laughs> Do you ever walk in the hallway and be like, shit, no, shit, shit, shit. <laughs> Can't remember your name. Hey, buddy. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he didn't answer that question. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> I know I would be like that. That's why. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, we're at uh, just shy of 1.9, and on the service side, we have uh, 10, uh, a separate one for proactive, and then we have. Uh, five other people in management, sales, uh, three people in sales, so. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that saying, sometimes it's uh, easier to give birth than to raise the dead. Uh, last night we had 28 employees, this morning we have 26. Congrats. Yeah. <laughs> You're already more profitable <laughs> overnight, because overhead walks on two legs, baby, you know? Yeah, I know, it always happens at a producer's club meeting. All right. We're, we're at 3 million with 16 full-time. Okay. All right. So it was helpful, yes? Yeah, I think that you guys did a great job. Thank you.